so let's go over the homework which was due on Thursday. By the way, uh, when there are weather problems, uh, sometimes uh, UCCS is braver than I am and they decide that, you know, we'll uh, open anyway. So check my website because I, I, I'll put an announcement if, uh, you know, I think it's too dangerous and I won't show up. So you don't have to, to come here to find out, okay? This time they were quite good actually. They made decisions quickly, and uh, but uh, it has not always been the case. Okay, so I'm sorry. They call out the National Guard for a snow emergency. Color of the screens is closed. Then finally, he's successful. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know. Yes, but they opened it far too early. I had to go to class, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I thought the timing was good, actually. It's, uh... Okay. So for number two, of course, you have a formula that has been proved, uh, which tells you this. And to apply the formula, what, what you need is to know that f is differential what? f and g are differential what? a and uh, you need to also know that f of a is different from zero. Okay, then the formula holds. So you apply this formula for g equal one, then g prime is zero, and you get that one over f prime at a is going to be minus f prime, g is one, so f prime g is f prime over f squared at A. Okay, that's all you need to do. Did you use the chain rule on that as well? Yes, yes. You could use the chain rule. Now, uh, for 3, we are going to show that uh, g prime is 0. So g is f square plus f prime square. So of course this means that for every x, g of x is f square of x and f prime uh, the square of f prime of x as well. So g prime, according to the uh, chain rule, is 2f prime f, and this is 2f prime f second. And you can factor 2f prime and you get f plus f second. But you are told that f plus f second is identically zero, okay, for every x. So this is zero, and therefore g prime is identically zero. So g is constant on the interval r. Okay, and the way you, you know what the constant is, is uh, simply by plugging in at zero, for instance. Uh, th this is what we use to show uh, that cosine square plus sine square is one. Always for every x, we, we use exactly this fact. Because uh, it's, it's the case that for sines and cosines, this is true. The second derivative is the opposite of a function. Okay, so that's taken directly from there. Number four.
So you are told that f prime is equal to g prime on the open interval phi. And of course, when you have two functions running around, it's always tempting to define a third function. Because the, you, you can say things about the difference here that are going to be useful. So you can define f to be f h to be f minus g. And this implies that h prime is 0. Okay, Since uh, uh, f prime is equal to g prime, when I take the derivative of h, I get f prime minus g prime. That's 0. So h prime is 0, which means that h is a constant. Which means that f minus g is a constant on i. Or another way to write this is that for every x, we have f of x equal to g of x plus a constant on i. Number five is going to look a lot like a, a, a similar problem we, we did in class. Uh, so you assume that your function is differentiable. You have that your f prime is positive and or zero, and you want to show that f is increasing. So uh, you take x smaller than y in i. You do f of x minus f of y. And um, uh, that's going to be, OK, so before we do that, let's note that f is differentiable on x, y open. And f is continuous on x, y closed. The reason we can say that is because we are assuming that the function is differentiable everywhere in i. Therefore, it's differentiable on the subset of i. And it's continuous everywhere. Therefore, it's going to be continuous in x, y closed like this. Okay, so, but always check your hypothesis before applying a theorem. So you get that uh, your, your mean value theorem applies and f of x minus f of y is f prime of c times x minus y, where c uh, belongs to x, y. But f prime of c is positive or 0. That's our hypothesis. Therefore, uh, f prime of c times x minus y is negative or 0. Okay, Because we are assuming that x, x is strictly less than y, so x minus y is a negative quantity. We're multiplying across by a negative number. We reverse our sign, as always. And therefore, if this is negative, it means that this uh, side of the equality must be negative as well, which uh, proves that your f is increasing. Okay, because you have started with x less than y, and you end up with f of x less than f of y. It means that the function f does not change an inequality, which is the definition of being increasing. A decreasing function is a function that changes your inequality after you apply it. Do you use the definition of a derivative and show f of a plus h is greater than f of a? Uh, the problem is that you uh, are going to get, because what, so if you use that, if you use the, uh, 
the definition, you, you get that the limit of f of a plus h minus f of a over h is uh, f prime of a, and this is positive. So, what you are going to do, yes, is claim that uh, if, so, uh, let's see, it, it's really going to give you a lot more work by doing this way because you have to distinguish several cases. Let's say, for instance, that f prime of a is equal to zero. Then you are in bad shape because you don't know what's going to happen near your limit. Now, if it's strictly positive, you can argue that, be, that because the limit is strictly positive, if h is small enough, then this thing is going to be strictly positive. Okay, but you know the mean value theorem solves all that. That's that's the beauty of it. Uh, you just use a formula and you get your inequality. But that's the idea of a, of a mean value theorem. It's like reproving the mean value theorem every time, which you know is some work. An example of a differentiable function which is strictly increasing but whose derivative is not strictly positive. Um, there are many examples. Uh, for instance, f of x equals x cubed. This is a strictly, uh, this is a strictly increasing function, and the way you would prove that this is strictly increasing is, for instance, first uh, take uh, two positive numbers like uh, this, like a and b, and then. Uh, you would prove that a cube is less than b cube by by doing basically the technique we did to show that in this case a square is less than b square. You multiply by a quantity, then you multiply by another quantity, and then you compare things. Okay, you don't really need to do it here. The, the graph is enough. But I mean that's that's a case where if you want to prove strictly increasing, you need to. Uh, go back to the definition of what it means to be increasing. You cannot use the derivative because precisely the derivative is zero at some point. So you, you cannot say uh, by using only the derivative that uh, your function is going to be strictly increasing. That's what the problem is. And once you have it for positive numbers, then you have it for negative numbers as well. Uh, it's, you, you just, uh, you do it for, you, then you, you, you do it for negative a, negative b, you multiply across and you get your inequality. But, um, uh, again, the graph is enough here because we, the issue is different from uh, showing uh, inequalities in this problem. So once you have this, then you, you have that f prime of x is 2x squared, which is 0 at 0. So your f prime is positive or zero, but f is strictly increasing. Now, what is true is that if f prime is strictly is strictly positive, f is strictly increasing. But uh, as you see, you may have f prime equal to zero and still a strictly increasing function. Assume that f prime of a is zero. Does this imply a local extreme occurs at a? So same example works, right? You just say So you have f prime of a equal to zero. Well, uh, take well, take f of x equal to x of q. Again, f prime of x is three x squared. F prime of zero is zero. But you have no extremum 
at zero. And you can either invoke the graph, which is not really rigorous, or you can prove it by saying, well, if A is strictly less than zero, then I shouldn't take A. Uh, if X is strictly less than zero, then X cubed is strictly negative. If X is strictly positive, then X cubed is strictly positive. Therefore, this cannot be an extremum because if I take an interval around zero, I have at the same time numbers that are that gives me f of x bigger than f of zero and f of x smaller than f of zero. Okay? Our definition of extremum is you can't find an interval around your point where either your function is above that point or below. Here it's neither above nor below. And that's because you, the definition uh, forces you to take an interval surrounding the point. You cannot just take an interval to the right or to the left. That's not allowed in the definition. Constant would be uh, would would fit the definition. Uh, const if you look at the, at the definition of an extremum, all the points of a domain are extrema for a constant function. Okay, so they all are okay. So, so that that doesn't give you a counterexample. Uh, okay, do a graph so that has a local maximum, but it's not differential at one. So you, you want a local <coughs> Okay, you just have a graph of this type where you have a corner at one and therefore it's not going to be differential at one. Was eight included in this homework or the following one? Yes. Uh, okay. Questions? Okay. So, for the test, uh, also, uh, you have a few theorems to memorize. You need to know the hypothesis, you need to know the conclusion, and you also need to know in which situation to use what. In some of the homework, there is a lot of confusion. The intermediate value theorem, for instance, is used to solve an equation. It tells you that if you are here and you want to get here, you must cross in between. Okay, so usually it will give you the solution of an equation. The extreme value theorem, on the other hand, tells you that there is a maximum that exists under some conditions and a minimum exists. Okay, so it's existence of extrema. And the mean value theorem is a relation between the function and its derivative. So as you're going to see for the homework which is due on Thursday, it gives you some interesting inequalities. Okay? When you see an inequality like the one you need to prove, uh, yr minus xr less than ryr minus 1, y minus x, you should look at this and say that that's the derivative of this function. So I have a function here, I have a derivative here, there must be some mean value term. Okay? And this, you know, you need to redo the problems again to, to make sure you understand that. We will skip 5.4, uh, it's maybe a little more difficult, but people who are thinking about graduate school may read it and should read it so that uh, you know they get familiar with important uh, notions. Uh, there are several things that are tied together. Uh, okay, so what uh, we didn't finish, I think, uh, yeah, I didn't give you an example. Of. So let me give you an example. Uh, okay. More examples for 5.3? Yeah. 
So question on that last one. Yeah. You got the uh, absolute value one. You have a maximum to know. Uh, is it enough to say that we know that an absolute value uh, is not differentiable at that point? Or do we need to go farther and say? Well, usually, so you are talking about uh, which problem specifically? Uh, 7B. 7B. Oh. Well, here uh, the question was just draw the graph, so you can stop there. But uh, if not, yes, you 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 would need to argue that an absolute value is not differentiable, and you know you can you you may depending on how the question is phrased, the objective of of a question may be you know prove that uh, that particular function is not differentiable. And then you would do uh, what we did for absolute value, which is take a sequence that approaches from the left and show that the slopes, the slope is 1, and then from the uh, right, the slope is minus 1, the limit does not exist. But it wouldn't be enough to say if you have a combination of functions, say, x minus 1 and absolute value, and then the that's perilous because you you have a. It's not, it won't, it's yeah. Combine the same function. I'm not sure this is a true statement. Okay. okay uh, uh, I would need to think about it, okay. but I'm pretty sure we can find counterexamples where, by uh, composing, you you smooth uh, things out and you get something. Uh, like if you took. Uh, yeah. Well, what are those functions where it's nothing and it goes up and stays up? Well, that's not even continuous. Yeah, but you, I can add two of those together. And get a continuous function. Yeah, good. Get a yeah. straight line, yeah. Yeah, that's a good example. But you are adding them, you are not uh, composing. Step functions, that's what they call Yeah. You added the two of them. Yeah, uh, another example would be uh, take uh, g of x equal absolute value of x and take f of x equal uh, x squared and compose these two. So I'm taking the square of an absolute value. I'm getting x squared. So now I have a differentiable function. So that's, that's the type of thing where uh, you need to be, in order to, to have that type of statement, you need to be able to undo this thing, you see, and take inverses. And, uh, otherwise, it's. Okay, so going back to that equation, uh, type problem. Um, yeah, uh, what do we? So assume that we have. So I assume that, show that equation x6 plus x squared plus 1 equals 0 has at most two real solutions. Okay, so a priori you have a power of six, you may have six real solutions. And um, how do you know that you have at most two real solutions? Well, you do prove by contradiction. Assume that uh, you have three solutions. Three or more, but uh, I'm just considering uh, uh, the first three, the smallest three. Uh, then uh, you don't have, you see, so. You need to define f of x equal to x6 plus x squared plus 1. 
And this is a polynomial, of course, and is differentiable uh, as many times as you want. And uh, um, it's um, so you can take the derivative of this thing. And uh, the other thing is that you are assuming that f of a is equal to f of b is equal to f of c. Uh, they are all zero because they are solutions of your equation. Now, uh, by Rolle's theorem, and Rolle's theorem applies, of course, because I'm talking about the differential equation on an interval, which is r, uh, we have a d between a and b, or let's call it d1, between a and uh, b, which is 0. This is Rolle's theorem, or but you don't. It's the mean value term. I mean, you you memorize this as you want. Okay, it's a particular case of a mean value term. And then here you must have uh, f prime of d two equal to zero. Now, how do I know that d one and d two are not the same? Because that's going to be important. Yes, D1 is strictly between A and B, and the D2 is strictly between uh, B and C. So I know that D1 and D2 are not the same. Now, um, F prime, which by the way is 6x to the fifth plus 2x, uh, f prime is also differentiable. Of course, since uh, we are talking about a polynomial. And uh, therefore, again by Rolle's theorem, we know that there is a d3 belonging to d1, d2 such that f second of d3 is 0. Okay. This time we use the fact that f prime of d1 is 0, f prime of d2 is 0. They have the same value. So the derivative of f prime must have a point where it's 0. The derivative of f prime being f second, we know that f second of d3 must be 0. It's because I'm using Rolle's theorem between D1 and D2. So let's, let's have a look at f second of x. And that's going to be 30x to the fourth plus 2, which is always larger than 2. So that can never be 0. And we have a contradiction. So f second is never 0. OK, so this, this method allows you to uh, count your number of solutions. I mean, to, to bound the number of solutions. Now, if the question were, do I have at least one solution? What should I do? Find one. <laughs> Put it in your, uh, you know, theater hit button. Find one. What? Another suggestion? Then uh, <laughs> what can I do? Which one? Yes, the intermediate value term allows you to show that you have at least one solution. So how would I do that? I would find points, a point where the function is negative and a point where the function is positive and say, well, if it's negative and positive, it must be 0 somewhere. So it gives me uh, uh, the existence of a solution and it gives me even bounds on the solutions. 
Okay, it tells me uh, my solution, I have at least a solution between minus 1 and 3. Okay. Yeah, again I picked a function which uh, we, we know right away has no solution. Uh, so I thought I had been careful this time. Anyway, the method works and that's what you need to do and you, you use the uh, Rolle's theorem uh, every time to, to find whether you have a solution or not. Okay, so that's basically it for chapter 5 and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go over the homework on Thursday so that will give us more practice, yes? Right, except that exactly one means that you have to show that you have at least one, so you use the intermediate value term, and then you need to show that you have at most one, which means that there probably you use the mean value term. And you do proof by contradiction as here. Okay? So the intermediate value to prove that one exists and the um, Rolle's theorem to prove that uh, you can only have one. Correct. Other questions? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about chapter 6. 6.1 is a rather long section, so it's a good idea if we get started on that. So 6.1 is about the construction of the Riemann integral. Intuitively, what we are going to do is take a function which uh, is, you know, almost continuous. That's, uh, you, you can make that uh, statement precise. What does it mean to be almost continuous? But uh, intuitively, okay, you may have a few points where, where it jumps, but most of the time things are okay. And what you're trying to do is define a mathematical way to compute the area below your curve. Okay, that's what an integral is. And And the symbol is this. Now, how do you do that? Well, one, in, one way to do this is to say, I'm going to take rectangles like this, for instance. And compute the areas of the rectangles and take many, many rectangles and in the limit, I'll get exactly what I want. Okay, so that's, that's, our, that's the plan. So the difficulty is to show that you can do that, that the program is feasible, that there is a limit. When you take infinitely many rectangles, in the end you do get a number, at least when your function is continuous or you know, under certain conditions. And uh, the other part of a program is show all the properties of the integral. You know that if you do the, the integral of the sum, it's the sum of the integral. Uh, you know that uh, uh, the absolute value of the integral is less than the integral of the absolute value. So how do you prove all these things? Okay. So in a few weeks, you'll know all of that. Uh, so let's start with uh, our first definition. We say that, so we are going to work on a closed and bounded interval A, B.
And we say that P uh, 0 x1 xn is a partition of AB if uh, x0 is A and is strictly less than x1, strictly less than x2, and so on, and your last point is B. So how many points do I have in my partition? Not n. n plus 1. OK, because I start at 0. Like the program, so. <laughs> yeah, that can be an issue. OK. Now, uh, yeah, the other thing I should say, so there, there are two, two things that will happen over time. We'll be on a closed and bounded interval AB, and also uh, our function f is bounded. on AB. Okay, that's uh, always going to be the case. Then we'll add hypotheses. But the very minimum hypotheses are uh, these are hypotheses about the interval being closed and bounded and the function being bounded. Uh, we are going to use some notation for this. So we call Oh, okay. Yeah. So if we look at this set, we can say that this set is bounded above and non empty. Why can I say that? Why can I say that this set is bounded above? Yes. Bounded above by? No. Uh, you see, you're not looking at the x's. You're looking at the f of x's. Okay? So why is it bounded above? Well, we don't know if we have a max, but we, we are assuming that the function is bounded, right? So f of x is less than something. Okay. So when we write here that the function is bounded on AB, what, what we mean is f of x is less than m for all x. And therefore, it's bounded above by m and non-empty because f of a belongs to the set. Right? It's just an application of uh, our definition here. And therefore, we can apply the fundamental property of the reals and say that this set has a least upper bound. And I'm going to call this least upper bound capital M of F A B. Okay, so you see what beautiful notation I came with, up with. It's capital M because it's an upper bound. F, I'm talking about the function F, and AB because I'm on the set AB. Uh, the reason we have this notation is that we'll have different Fs and different sets. So we need to have something that takes all that into account. Now we can do exactly the same thing for the least upper bound, of course. No, for the greatest lower bound. So we can also say that f of x has 
a greater slower bound because it's bounded below it's bounded below because we're assuming our function is bounded and is non-empty. So the same thing. This time the notation is the greater slower bound is going to be lowercase m f a b. Okay. So now uh, we are going to form the rectangles, okay, the different areas, but we'll have, uh, as you can suspect, a lower estimate, which is rectangles that are below the curve, and an upper estimate, which is with rectangles above the curve. Okay? And these are the so-called Darbu sums. If you're in a cocktail party, don't say Darbux. It's, uh, you don't pronounce the X in French at the end of a word. Just say Darbu, it, it will look better. And uh, so the upper Darbu sum is going to be denoted by. So for your Darbu sum, what's going to happen is that you're going to write it for a given function and for a given partition. The partition tells you where your rectangles are. Okay? So you have your partition. You start here at A, that's your x is 0, and then you have different points, and your B is your xn. And then you have your upper, so how, yeah, so let's, let's do, a, let's do a monotone decreasing function here. Um, so you're going to take the highest point in your interval, and you are going to sum these guys. Okay, so that's what the upper Darbu sum FP is. So how do you write this mathematically? Well, this is going to be the sum from i equal 1 to n of m f xi minus 1 xi times xi minus xi minus 1. So I'm saying that I'm taking the least upper bound of my function f on the interval xi, xi minus 1. That's the height of the rectangle. And then I'm multiplying by the width, xi minus xi minus 1. And I'm summing because I have n rectangles. OK, does the definition make sense? Now, the lower Darbu sum is exactly the same thing, except that this time you take a lower end. And so this time, taking the same function, what you do is you take, so your a is here, your b is here, and you are taking the uh, lower rectangles, And that's the lower Darbu sum. And if we are lucky, 
when we take a partition with more and more points, the upper Darboux sum should start to look like the lower Darboux sum. Okay, there should be less and less space between the two. And at the very end, when we take the limit, the, we should get the same limits. Now, this is a complicated problem because uh, we, we need to take limits on sets of points, right? We, we need statements of a type, take all the partitions and, you know, when you let the partition have many, many points, infinitely many points, you should get to a limit. That's uh, trickier than the usual limit for a function or limit for a sequence. I have a function, it's my x which is going somewhere. Here, I have a function of a partition. So I'm looking at taking limits with respect to the number of points in my partition. Okay, it's kind of uh, indirect and that's why the construction is a little painful as you are going to see. So. Uh, one, one important remark, which should be fairly obvious, is that uh, the, the lower bound, of course, the greatest lower bound um, on any x psi minus 1 x psi is less than the least upper bound. Okay, because this is a lower bound of the set, this is an upper bound of the set. So of course the lower bound is less than the upper bound. That's what we're saying. And uh, uh, this, when you plug it in your different sums, is going to tell you that for every p, partition P, we are going to have that the lowest, lower Darboux sum is of course less than the upper Darboux sum. Okay, that's not very difficult to believe. Maybe we should do an example. Yeah, let's do an example to so uh, let's take uh, f of x equal x square. Let's take a b equals zero one, and let's take a partition. Uh, 0, 1 fourth, 1 half, 3 fourth, 1. The only requirement for a partition is that you start at 0, you finish at 1. And then you take, you know, as many points as uh, you they feel don't like. Have to be evenly spaced. They don't, but they usually will be. So, uh, what's mf of 0, 1 fourth. Yeah. 0, yeah. And then mf of 1 fourth half. Uh, 1 16. This is because this is an increasing function on 0, 1. Okay, we are doing from 0 to 1. And so we, in order to have the lower bound, we are going to get the leftmost point of your integral every time. So n of f 1 half 3 fourth is going to be 1 fourth. And m of f uh, 3 fourth 1 is going to be 9 16. And now we do the lower sum. 
it's going to be 0 times the distance, which is 1 fourth, plus 1 16 times 1 fourth, plus 1 fourth times 1 fourth, plus 1 fourth times 9 16. So we end up with 1 plus 4, 5 plus 9, 14 over 64. That's for our lower Darbu sum. And then we do the same thing for the upper sum. So this is 1, 16. This time we are taking the right hand point because we are looking for uh, the higher rectangle. And so we are going to get that the upper Darbu sum is 1 fourth times 1 16, 1 fourth times 1 fourth, 1 fourth times 9 16, and 1 fourth times 1, which is 1 plus 4 5 plus 9 14 plus 1630. So the precision here is not very good. I mean, we know that our area is between 14 over 64 and 30 over 64. Of course, the exact result is one third, which hopefully is in between. Yeah. Okay. So this tells us that we may need a lot of points to, you know. Okay. So uh, in the notes, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to distinguish between the integral and the notion of integrability. We are first going to discuss which functions are in integrable and what it means to be integrable. And then we'll see how to compute the integrals. Okay, so the two things will be separate. So the, the big definition here is the following. F, so F which is bounded. So you see why I need bounded? If I don't have bounded, I don't have upper, I don't have a Darbu sums. Okay, I have nothing to work with. That's why I need to assume that my function is bounded uh, on A, B, closed and bounded. Then F is said to be Riemann integrable. If for every epsilon there exists a partition P C 
such that the upper Darbusan minus the lower Darbusan is positive and less than epsilon. Okay? The definition makes sense because that's exactly what I want. I want to be able to squeeze my area between a lower Darbu sum and an upper Darbu sum. So I give myself an epsilon and then I say, well, find me a partition that will do a job. Again, this looks a lot like convergence, except that this time, instead of having to find a natural n, you need to find a whole partition. Okay? It's going to be a nightmare. No, I'm joking. That's not true. But. So, uh, so can we apply our beautiful definition to at least something? Well, a constant function, for instance. That, that should be fairly easy to check. So assume that your function f is identically constant. I add my constant here. And I give myself a certain partition. What's the lower Darbu sum for this function? Yes, it's going to be C times B minus A. Why? Well, all the rectangles are here, and I'm going to add these rectangles and get the big rectangle. Okay, I can check it. I mean, I can do my, uh, you know, uh, check the definition, compute every uh, M, lowercase m, capital uh, M, and I'll get this. Okay, but we see it graphically. The upper Darbu sum is going to be what? Exactly the same thing. So you get C B minus A. Therefore, for every partition the upper minus the lower partition is zero. And that's always less than epsilon because we are taking an epsilon strictly positive. Okay? So we can conclude, well, F is Riemann integral. So that gives us our first example, and then we'll go on with different, uh, uh, different examples. So we'll show that the monotone functions are always Riemann integrable, and the continuous functions, well, that we won't show because it's, uh, I have done it, but it's, uh, it's more work, so we'll skip that proof. But that gives you a class of a big class of uh, Riemann integrable functions. But up to this point, we haven't talked about the integral. Okay? We haven't said, how do you compute the actual number? Okay? And that will come in a second uh, phase. OK, let's stop here for today.